Hi, I everyone. Guess. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here tonight. We are very, very excited. And uh, this is an amazing venue. Uh, as soon as I walked out, I was like, wow, this is, this is incredible. We were just talking about it. Uh, I'm so lucky to be up here with you. And the company you've built is amazing and all the progress you've Thank made. You. And uh, really excited to do kind of a, a deep dive into kind of yourself as a founder and, and your journey. Um, so I think the, the first question was really, the introduction question of, you know, what's your background and how did entrepreneurship kind of come into your life? Yeah, definitely. And uh, thanks for moderating this today. Of course. Yeah, definitely first time speaking in a, a chapel uh, for me. Um, but yeah, I think just as a, you know, kind of starting point, uh, founder and CEO of Rapid API and what we are today is the world's largest API marketplace. So helping developers worldwide discover and connect to public APIs. Um, and then helping larger companies manage uh, a lot of their internal APIs. And where it started out was actually as an open source, it's, it's kind of funny reminiscing about it now, but it was an open source repository on GitHub called Awesome APIs. Yes. Um, so just a collection of APIs on GitHub that we really liked, that we thought were useful for developers, and collected some code snippets or uh, integration guides around. And over time, it started picking up a lot of steam. Uh, we got to about 5,000 stars on GitHub, so a lot of people around the world using it, contributing new examples to it. Um, and at that point, uh, that was about four years ago, uh, turned it into a company. Oh, that's, that's great. And did you, did you see it as a company when you were started working on it? Or how did you go about really being like, this is actually a company, I'm going to get a team and start working on it? Yeah. Um, and it's funny because initially it started um, as this, again, open source project mostly deployed to developers uh, around hackathons, um, doing some POCs, doing some side projects. But we didn't necessarily see it as a tool. Um, and back then, you know, APIs were starting to pick up steam, but even APIs themselves weren't that widely adopted. Uh, so we, start, we didn't necessarily see it as a tool that real businesses were going to be using to build real software initially. Um, and one of the catalysts for us realizing that you can actually turn it into a business was actually just seeing the API economy as well growing. Right. Um, so Twilio, uh, SendGrid, Stripe, like all these companies raising massive rounds. Right, right, right. And so, you know, I'll, I'll give myself a quick context on, on myself and who I am from the introduction. So I, I am a principal at Unshackle Ventures, and we are a pre-seed fund that focuses on immigrant founders. And so uh, we look for founders just like you. <laughs> and we are really excited to uh, kind of tackle the barriers that we see can hold back some of the most amazing entrepreneurs, uh, which are immigrant entrepreneurs. Uh, and that includes both access to capital, uh, a network, and obviously a lot of immigration support. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a little bit about me. So I would love to kind of understand how you came together with your team. So your co-founders is kind of like the, ma the first question that comes to mind when you're starting is, okay, you have, a, you have an idea, you have a company that you built from kind of some of these early projects, but who, who was your team and how did you go about this, especially being from a pretty distributed team, it seems like? Yeah, yeah, and um, you know, today our team is mostly concentrated between engineering, which is still based out of Tel Aviv, Israel, where I'm from, um, and our entire sales, um, sales marketing product team that are out here in San Francisco. I think building out the team in Israel was easier. Um, those were the people that I, a lot of them I grew up with or I knew pretty early on. Uh, a lot of them were also contributing to the project or I knew around hackathons and events in Tel Aviv even before. Um, before starting the company. So those were kind of like the, lay hang the low hanging fruits for us. Um, the tougher part for me was building out the team uh, out here. So moving out here uh, about three years ago, three and a half years ago even, um, not knowing anybody, not having that network, um, and not necessarily knowing how to appeal for um, recruits out here that we're trying to bring on, that was the toughest part in building the team. And what was that kind of tipping point or that you were like, I have to start thinking of having some team over there or considering the Bay Area? I mean, Tel Aviv has actually an amazing entrepreneur ecosystem. So kind of what pushed you to say, look, we, we should expand. We should tap into Silicon Valley. Yeah, I think so. The catalyst really uh, or the trigger for us was we got into 500 startups. Uh, so we came here to join the accelerator program. Uh, and that's kind of what initially got uh, me and some of our early uh, team members out here. But I think all along we realized that, you know, all of the big developer conferences are in San Francisco. A lot of the big developer communities out, are out in the Bay Area. 
Um, a lot of the big companies and API companies that we are working with are based out here. So it kind of just made, it all along made sense to have some sort of presence here. Got it. And how did you go about the fundraising process? So it seems like 500 startups was kind of that uh, anchor to come into the Bay Area and, and thinking of a long term. But before that, how did you even find 500 startups? How did you decide how to go around fundraising or go on an accelerator or an incubator program? Yeah, so when we, when, when we kind of flipped it from an open source project into a real company, we raised uh, $500,000 from a local angel in Israel. Uh, and that kind of gave us the initial capital to hire the first team um, and then actually fly out here and join uh, 500 startups. And then after the program, we went out to raise our seed. Uh, and that was more of like a classic fundraising process, uh, you know, putting together the deck, uh, meeting a few investors. Um, and we were very lucky to meet um, Andreessen Horowitz, which ended up uh, leading our serious seed. That's great. It's, yeah. it's an amazing fund. So, you know, being from not the Valley, uh, what do you think were some of those key either decisions or barriers that you kind of really had to go through to get into the door of some of those bigger funds? I mean, obviously, a lot of these funds are very warm intro is a must or entrepreneur, portfolio company introduction, like how, how did you, did you know that this was a thing before? Did you, was it based on good advisors or 500? Yeah, I think obviously networking was a big part of it. Um, and that's again where I think coming out here, actually doing the 500 startup program for uh, four months, going through that process was a great catalyst in like building that initial network mm -hmm. um, of people that you know. And the second, what was early on a barrier for me um, was just learning how to, you know, it's, it sounds kind of funny, but I think everybody here who uh, moved into the Bay Area, especially internationally, can relate. Learning kind of how to talk the talk, walk the walk, being in the Bay Area, how like Bay Area pitch decks look, how Bay Area investors like to think. Yeah. Uh, it's very ambiguous, but it was a big barrier where I can definitely see, you know, how a lot of these conversations after learning to do that, uh, really became better. Yeah, of course. And so, and I think a lot of really good companies don't get a good shot at it because they don't know some of the soft rules of, of the game, I guess. Yeah, and the, and the terminology that you use, the, um, you know, the positioning, the ambitions of the company, um, and even just understanding that, you know, it's a different magnitude and different orders of scale that some of the investors here are looking for. And as an entrepreneur for other, you know, entrepreneurs here, what are some of, like, the tools or resources you use to really kind of catch up to what is the language and some of those? Was it mostly advisors and mentors, other entrepreneurs? I think it's just deep immersion. Um, like trying to, you know, come out here early on, meet as many people as we can. Uh, again, the accelerator was uh, really great for that. Uh, doing a lot of, you know, networking event and social event just to get to know other people in the industry. Um, and. You know, if you're doing that deep immersion and your your eyes are open, you're trying to pick up those uh, those skills, um, then it's not impossible to do. Yeah, no, I, I yeah. definitely agree with that. So let's move a little bit more internal now. So aside from the fundraising and external investors, which many times you know you don't have a lot of control of, even in the best scenarios, it really is conversation for conversation. Um, what were some of the do you think some of the key early strong decisions that you made that set you up for a really good fundraise, either yeah. for 500 or post 500 that you think a lot of entrepreneurs you know, should focus on more or really kind of gets them through the finish line? Yeah, that, that's actually a really good question. Um, and it's a funny point just on your comment to have not a lot of control. I, I don't think a lot of people get, get that in. You know, we've kind of been lucky or unlucky in a sense to be on both sides of it. But for fundraising, I feel like when it's going well, it's a stressful process. And yeah. when it's not going well, it's a stressful process. Yes. <laughs> uh, like, no, I, I don't think a lot of people actually enjoy doing it. Um, but I think that the things that make us good or that uh, set, up, set us up well uh, for fundraising, a lot of it was just building those relationships earlier on with investors, especially as we were not looking for capital, just mm -hmm. actually getting to know the people on the other side, uh, showing them where, where we were going to go, and then actually delivering on these promises, or sometimes not delivering, and, but being able to explain why or why we pivoted or changed strategy. I think that just built a lot of trust for us um, early on with uh, venture capital firms that we later uh, went to actually fundraise from. Um, and then another tech, like, the, this is kind of like a technical point, but it did end up being helpful for us was 
pretty early on flipping on flipping from being a foreign entity to being actually a Delaware or US based entity. Um, it sounds technical, it sounds insignificant, but it just helps move in the process. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, for with sure. A lot of these. Uh, I think we this is something we've seen as well, and, and we work with our portfolios as part of kind of the onboarding process. Is Delaware Incorporation just allows for that conversation to be smoother, and you don't want to get bugged in those like legal facts. Um, so I think you actually bring up an, a great point on building those relationships with investors early, um, and I think. I mean, I totally agree with you on this, and I think from my perspective, one of the things that we see a lot is that advice that broad tends to sometimes a lot of entrepreneurs are like, I want to continue updating investors or keeping them in the loop. Um, but I think something that is very clear from you as a founder is that you're incredibly diligent about your research on investors and funds that might be a good fit. Uh, and so I imagine you didn't keep every investor ever updated on that warm. Yeah, and, and I think there is also a kind of fallacy around that. Like you hear a lot of um, entrepreneurs early on speaking about how they pitch like a hundred firms uh, yes. and it just takes one. Well, that's admirable. I think that a lot of time if you do some of the research, like if you cut it first of all vertically, like who's investing in the space that we're in? If you're doing uh, blockchain, they're not every, uh, well, for a period it was every VC, but <laughs> really not every VC does blockchain. If you're doing like sure. B2C, B2B, B2D, you know, cutting it vertically and then looking at the stage you're at, there shouldn't really be more than, you know, 10 or 20 investors that are relevant for that. Um, and it's really about identifying them early on and then investing in those rather than, you know, more of the spray and spray, spray, and spray approach. Yeah, no, no, I totally agree. And so in terms of, let's, let's think about how, as, as you were fundraising, how did you decide how much to raise? You know, there's currently right now this big debate in, in, in the investor world on, should you raise as much as you can and burn as quickly as you can and grow as fast as you can? Or should you kind of break it into chunks, raise what you need to, kind of de-risk at every step of the way and not lose so much of your company, right? And there's pros and cons for each one, but I'd love to kind of hear your take on it or what you've learned from, from now going through the, the process itself. Yeah, it's, it's, an, it's always an interesting question. Um, I think something that has impacted a lot of our fundraising strategy, or at least was in the back of the mind, was it seems like since 2016, when we did our first seed round, there's always been the sense in Silicon Valley of like winter is coming, like gear up because it's got like things are not going to look as great two quarters from now. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if you saw that too, but it's always like this winter is coming mentality. Yeah, I joined Venture in 2015, and winter has been coming since then, and I'm still waiting for it. And, and it's not, and <laughs> so it's, it's, it hasn't been here, so, which on the one hand is really comforting. Like I'm glad we have this, yes. um, you know, multiple years of plenty. Um, on the other hand, it still seems like it should come at some point. Uh, but honestly, you know, that is something that has influenced our fundraising a little bit. Uh, but for me, the way to look at it has always been, where do I need to be in order to raise the next round? Um, like, wh what metrics do I need? Like, almost, and in, in recent case, we've actually done this, like creating our, when we raised our Series B win, I hadn't created our Series C deck. Uh, like, what numbers do I need to raise a successful Series C? Yeah. How long does it take me to get there? Add six months for the actual fundraising. So that's the runway that I need. And then just reverse engineering from there how much money we actually need. Yeah. No, and I think, I think that makes sense. I think some of the main kind of like, facets you might see in the early stage sometimes is I see entrepreneurs come in and say, look, we just want to we wanna hit 100K users. And you name it, like without context of what vertical they're in or consumer enterprise, and, and the question is always like, why? Right? What, what is the follow-up metric that tells you that is success, right? So I think sometimes digging a little bit deeper in that and, and doing that backward planning of what is necessary, but also understanding why is it necessary uh, of, you know, one ARR at the Series A. Like, what, what does that look like? And, and I think that's... One of those things entrepreneurs sometimes focus on the metrics and don't realize you have to plan backwards also in terms of product. Yeah, and, and I think that the two, like the two biggest with fundraising is, or like the two biggest failure modes actually is you didn't raise enough and then you can grow well for like a year, reach the point where you need to fundraise. You've actually been growing well, like multiplying or, double, or like doubling or tripling your, um, your numbers, but just not well enough for the next stage. And now you need to start looking at doing a very bad fundraise or um, like barely scraping it by or doing a bridge or you raise too much and then you just end up spending too much. Because like, you know, the idea of like, we'll raise a lot and keep it in the war chest but still be nimble, I haven't seen that actually work with any company that I'm aware of. Got it, yeah, no, <laughs> I, I, I agree. 
What would you recommend for entrepreneurs that, let's say, don't come before that seed round, but you know, have raised 500K from angels, family and friends, or you know, back in their countries, um, and are thinking about like, how to prepare for that Series A? What do you, and this is obviously you know, like from your experience, um, and it varies per vertical, but what do you think are some of those key internal of your company areas to really focus on and hone in? to get that Series A kind of, not necessarily metrics, but, but what do you think as, as a founder you should really focus on for, for getting that credibility? Yeah, I, I mean, I think for Series A, and it's funny, like you're the investor um, on stage, like you probably should be able to speak better to that than me, but what we've been looking at is mostly optimized, or, or when we were raising our Series A, is really being able to show product market fits. Um, and for, mostly on the enterprise side for us, that was important. Yeah. Um, and being able to have really referenceable customers uh, that are using the platform that are very avid about it. Like it doesn't have to be many. I think for us it was like two or three. But it was two or three that were really excited about the product, we're eager to hop on the phone with investors and tell them how much they like the product. Uh, we're definite that they're gonna renew uh, and even expand their uh, engagement with us. And that showed that you know, there's a clear need and the product answers that. And then, between then and the Series B, it's just showing that we can actually scale that distribution. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that, that makes sense. And how did you decide two or three customers, per se? Which I know it's different for everyone, but how did, what was kind of your framework on deciding what is enough customers? Was it mostly yeah. VC feedback, or were I, you like... I think for us, that's what we had, really. Um, but it was not necessarily... It's not necessarily that we were planning for that number. It was just, you know, one is one. We wanted to have multiple, and we're at the point where we had, like free customers that are super excited about the platform uh, and very referenceable, and we felt like that was enough validation um, for the market that we're onto something. That makes sense. Uh, so we have a few minutes here left. I think the, the last question I had for you was, looking back now, some of the things in your early days of a founder that you really stressed about, that you wish you hadn't stressed out about as much, that didn't kind of, you know, that 80-20 rule of, it really, those did not matter as much as some of the other things. Interesting. Um, or the opposite, things you wish that you would have focused on more and doubled down more to get there faster, whichever yeah. one works. So I'll give one of each. Yeah. Uh, I think stressing down on, like, very early on, I at least was very cautious all the time of only investing in things that scales and building processes about everything, like processifying like everything. Um, like um, I feel like Andy Grove would have been really proud of, of how we were running the company then. Like we were trying to build, pro we were doing like one onboarding a quarter for a new employee, and yet we had a really nice process for doing it, uh, like really flashed out. Um, and we, you know, we were doing one offboarding a year, and we had a process for that. We we're doing one customer onboarding every four months, and we had a really good process for that with collaterals and everything. And we spent a lot of time that we shouldn't have spent back then because like th those things mostly need to be agile. Right. Uh, so I don't think it's something that was, we're stressing, we're kind of stressing about it, but <laughs> um, really it was just a lot of time that we should, could have spent elsewhere. And like now when we're like 65 people, now it's becoming more important. Um, and one thing that I feel like we haven't stressed about enough was just building the culture in the company. Um, so you know, in that turning the phase between being six people and like we're all on a phone call like once or twice a day and we're all very much in line uh, to now being multiple teams with middle management um, and scaling the company uh, towards being 100 people pretty soon. Um, building out that, like it's something that we've invested a lot in in the past six months. But earlier on, I think that as a founder, I saw it as this fluffy thing that like, yeah, everybody's talking about it and it's this feel good thing, but you don't really, we didn't really put our back into it. Yeah. Um, and we've been feeling it since. Like, it's something that I wish we would have gotten a head start on. Oh, I, think, I think that's an amazing, great point. Um, we have actually for one more question, which I think will be great for, for this audience and for your background and my background. I'm, I'm Colombian, so you're an immigrant. Uh, how do, has that experience kind of, do you think have helped you as a founder? Is it a different framework? Is it helpful in having a you know, team abroad that is a lot more capital efficient? Like, what do you think was some of the superpowers that you have as an immigrant founder uh, that you think other founders should really leverage? Yeah, I think having team abroad for us was really helpful in terms of you know, staying capital efficient and being able to scale and hire from now two pools of human capital. Yeah. I think that was really good. Um, 
for me, I think, and I know that we're out of time, so I'll keep this short, but I think for me the biggest uh, benefit was having two cultures or two sets of experience to draw on, like how things were normally done in Bay Area, how things were normally, or what the Israeli enemy would do, mm -hmm. and being able to kind of mix and match between the two. And sometimes, you know, have a little chutzpah for me, or like use a little bit of that like Israeli, um, like not giving a, um, not, not caring too much mentality, yeah. um, and doing what I think should be done. Um, and using that to our advantage, which kind of worked sometimes. Well, I, I, I couldn't say better myself. Well, <laughs> thank you so much for uh, sitting down with me and having this chat. I hope the audience found it helpful, but we were heading out on our way. Yeah, <laughs> thank, thank you, you and uh, congrats, everyone. Thanks for coming.